Today I'm going to uh, show you how biocatalysis can be used as a tool for making renewable and sustainable polymers. Uh, so I, I will firstly briefly uh, underline a few concepts that link quite nicely with the previous presentation concerning the opportunities uh, uh, coming from biocatalysis. And then I will show, uh, I will go into details on a specific problem. So the polycondensation of uh, itaconic acid derivatives. And finally, at the end, I will discuss the feasibility of enzymatic polycondensation from the point of view of uh, scalability and process development. So, uh, as I said, uh, I'm not a polymer chemist, and my background is organic chemistry, but uh, all my career I studied how to exploit the catalytic potential of enzymes, enzymes that make cells the most complex and efficient chemical laboratory at low environmental impact. So, ideally, uh, we are trying to convince enzymes, actually, to uh, convert oh, sorry. Sorry. some simple molecules into more complex and valuable uh, products and material. For doing this, it's uh, really crucial, a very strong integration between chemistry and biotechnology. And basically, uh, I work at the interface between these two disciplines. Um, actually, very uh, alternative uh, analysis show that in the next 10 years, the biotechnology share of the world chemical production we reach almost 30%, and the impact in, on polymer synthesis will be double. Uh, that means that uh, it's very important to be able to work together uh, chemistry and uh, biotechnology. Uh, and because of that, uh, the European Commission underline the role of biotechnology as a key enabling technology uh, within Horizon 2020. Ideally, chemists and biotechnologists should work together for developing a robust platform of bio and biocatalysts and catalysts for, as we heard before, transforming renewable biomasses uh, by means of sustainable processes. Of course, uh, this is an ideal picture, but uh, what we have to uh, face is that uh, we must be competitive. Basically, the new processes, the new products must be competitive as compared to all processes and products, which actually have been optimized during decades of uh, work and research of chemists. Uh, so, at the end, what we have to do is to work hardly on the optimization of the processes. In this case, uh, we have to work on the uh, optimization of uh, biocatalyzed processes, which is a very complex multidisciplinary procedure that involve uh, engineers, microbiologists, and chemists, of course. Uh, firstly, on everything concerned application of enzymes, so stabilization of the biocatalyst, and of course, the design of the synthetic process. And today, I will focus my talk on some examples in this area. We can also, as chemists, give important uh, contribution in the design and engineering of enzymes, but I, I will not touch this aspect today. So, g moving to science, um, today I will try to give a, a quite realistic view of how we can proceed in optimizing a, a reaction, a, a biocatalyzed reaction for the 
synthesis of uh, polyester. Uh, first of all, I have to introduce a few concepts. Uh, the first concept is that uh, uh, generally, if we want to synthesize a polymer or an added value product using enzymes, we are not using whole cells but isolated enzymes, isolated product, proteins that actually must be converted in some catalysts that are recyclable, stable. So this is a first step where the optimization work has to be efficient. Secondly, we have to convince the biocatalyst to work under very harsh condition, not physiological condition. And this is a second step of the uh, optimization process. So uh, for doing that, traditionally in our group, we combine experiment and computational methods. We try to speed up the uh, process design to understand more in detail how the enzyme behaves using different computational methods, uh, uh, molecular mechanics, statistics, uh, and so on. Uh, from our point of view, it's very important that the computational methods are user-friendly and fast enough to be competitive with experiments. So, uh, now uh, I will show you briefly how by combining experiments and computational methods we try to solve the problem we face when we try to use enzyme in polycondensation of itoconic acid derivatives. So, uh, first of all, why should we use enzymes for synthesizing polyester? Uh, we, we heard before the very nice lecture of Professor Scandola who introduced to this uh, subject. Uh, basically, uh, in our idea was to exploit the selectivity of enzyme so that, for instance, you can exploit the ability of enzymes or recognize specifically alcohol groups without touching a thiol group and uh, leaving pendant functional groups so that you can design quite uh, interesting new uh, products and materials. The second factor that make enzymes interesting uh, are their extremely high efficiency even under my conditions. For instance, uh, the literature reports that you can use uh, monomers uh, um, presenting epoxy groups, and since you can use at 70 degrees, the uh, <coughs> polycondensation is achieved keeping the functional group uh, untouched. So, designing, as I said before, new uh, polymers with new functionalities. So, uh, going to uh, itaconic acids, we were interested in itaconic acid First of all, because it's a bio-based monomer. Basically, it can be produced through fermentation. Secondly, it has this nice uh, double one here that can be functionalized afterward. And uh, some industries express, express the interest in this monomer for, as a potential alternative for fumaric malic acid and anhydride. Unfortunately, um, if you look at the chemical polycondensation, it, it is generally carried out at a temperature above 150. That, that means that, uh, first of all, hydroponic acid undergo, undergoes uh, um, isomerization, but also the double uh, bond mostly undergoes a cross-linking. So uh, that's why we started studying the possibility of using light lasers at my condition between 50 and 70 degrees for making polyester of uh, uh, hydroponic acid. 
as we heard before from Professor Scandola, one of the most uh, popular biocatalysts in uh, enzymatic polyconization is uh, the lipase B from Cavite Antarctica because it's very stable, uh, doesn't need cofactor, it's active in low water medium and even without any solvent you can use it in very sticky and viscous system. In nature it hydrolyzes uh, uh, triglycerides, it's produced in tone scale uh, for detergent, basically it hydrolyzes the spot of uh, uh, dirt, dirt lipids on your clothes. Um, of course, uh, this reaction is reversible. That means that if we look at the mechanism of the reaction, um, this lipase, uh, which is a serine hydrolase, forms uh, acyl enzymes and then you can play with the nucleophile. You, you can remove water and use any alcohol uh, and then you obtain an ester. In this case, you can uh, catalyze a transesterification. Uh, the enzyme active site is organized in a nucleophile pocket that accommodates the alcohol and the acylic pockets where the uh, acyl group is attacked by the catalytic serine, this one here, to form the acyl enzyme. Okay. We try to uh, perform the polycondensation between dimethyl etaconate and butandiol and uh, immediately we realize what, uh, what is a chemical problem already described in the literature. Basically, uh, this carbon here uh, has a very low electrophilicity. It's, uh, this group has a very low reactivity so that, so that uh, at the end, uh, what you get is basically the formation of this dimer where the diol, the butan diol for instance, is acylated by this fast reacting acyl group. Then you get the trimer where both fast reacting acylated group reacted and then the reaction stops even after 72 hours the reaction starts. So, um, uh, this is just to, uh, to show more in detail from the HPLC profile how the reaction really is too slow and uh, elongation doesn't occur. So, we, we started thinking how to overcome this problem and promote elongation. And we decided to go uh, and look into the tail, what happens inside the active site of the enzyme. And we perform the docking of the dimer, basically the diol acylated by the fast reacting uh, acyl group, which is actually the major product after the first step of the reaction. Uh, what uh, uh, we study um, was the the number of productive poses, uh, what does it mean? Uh, how often the, this dimer accommodates inside the active site and uh, is geometrically oriented uh, in a favorable way so that uh, the catalytic serine can attack either this one or this acyl group so that uh, the formation of the acyl enzyme is promoted. Uh, what we realize is that uh, um, out of 100 poses, uh, only 27 were actually productive. Th so that means that lead to the formation of the uh, acyl enzyme. That show, uh, how slow the, actually the reaction go. But most importantly, only 2% of the poses indicates that uh, uh, the um, formation of the acyl enzyme occurs at this end here. That means that uh, this position is really unfavored for elongation. 
25% of the posters are uh, favorable with the attack of this acyl group here. What does it mean? It means also that the, the reverse of the reaction is very much favor. That means that uh, if you have a drop of water, if you have the methanol in the surrounding, which is just uh, uh, was released from the reaction, you really have the reverse of the reaction. And this was also demonstrated by the fact that uh, um, elongation improve a lot when you uh, work under reduced <coughs> pressure because you remove the extra nucleophile from the reaction environment. After war we tried, we tried thinking whether it was possible to play with the structure of the monomers so to induce the enzyme to modify uh, its ability to form the acyl enzyme. So uh, what we noticed was that uh, in this area here, in the uh, alcoholic pocket, there was uh, some stir hindrance. And uh, we tried to uh, find out whether by including some stir uh, bulky diol with some rigidity, was possible just to modify the orientation of the diode. And so we use uh, uh, the cyclohexan dimethanol. And uh, what we uh, obtain from the docking of the dimer, um, the same dimer as before, where the alcohol is acylated by the fast reacting acyl group, so we notice that actually the, uh, the ring doesn't fit in the alcoholic pocket here. But at the same time, the chances to get a, a productive attack of the slow reacting acyl group increased. Uh, altogether, uh, the um, probability to have an acyl enzyme is not very high. S that means that we expect slow reaction rate, but nevertheless, the elongation is more favored as compared to hydrolysis and methanolysis, so the reverse of the reaction. And indeed, what we found was that elongation in the presence of uh, cyclohexyl dimethanol was more favorable. It was really slow, but it occurs. The reaction doesn't stop. Okay, this is maybe one tool we have in our hand. But uh, the second uh, way for uh, promoting elongation somehow was uh, to use ter uh, ternary mixtures or monomers, basically to add in the reaction mixture also adipic acid, which is a fast-reacting diacid. And uh, so, uh, as you see here, you can reach, uh, after 72 hours, a maximum of 14, 15 units, uh, which, most importantly, uh, have in their structure the double bonds, which is not modified during the process, so that can be further modified. Okay, uh, this is the beginning of the story from the chemical point of view, but now uh, I would like to uh, discuss the feasibility of the whole process. Okay, we saw that the reaction is very slow. 72 hours to get uh, maximum 14, 15 units. What we can do from the side, from the point of view of process configuration, for promoting the scalability, the feasibility of uh, polyester synthesis using enzymes. If you look at the literature, indeed, uh, Richard Gross uh, tested a lot of monomers and he demonstrated the feasibility of a lot of different uh, polycondensation at lab scale. Nowadays, however, there are, I, I think, no very little example of application at industrial level of this uh, 
synthesis. Actually, um, in the 90s, there was a company, sorry, the Buxton Den Chemicals, that actually uh, scale up a enzymatic uh, polycondensation, uh, adipic acid and butandiol, for the synthesis of uh, polyester to be used in coating and uh, adhesive applications. The molecular weight they reach was not so high, but the process was um, considered uh, sustainable from the point of view, uh, from the industrial point of view. Uh, after a few years, uh, the process was dismissed. And we, uh, some years ago, we started thinking why the uh, enzymatic synthesis of polyester didn't take, uh, take place in the industry. And what we found out was actually one of the major problems was due to the cost of the biocatalyst. In order to have a competitive and economically sustainable process, you must be able to recycle your catalyst and uh, recover the catalyst active and efficient. Uh, the problem um, was that uh, most of the reaction reports in the literature are carried out with the commercial biocatalyst produced by Novozyme, uh, which is Novozyme 435. It's, uh, it's made by a light base B from Candida Antarctica adsorbed on acrylic resins. Uh, that means that uh, if you carry out uh, a polyester synthesis, which is a viscous process, uh, system, you get uh, the enzyme leaching, the protein detached from the support. And uh, first of all, you lose in the efficiency activity of your biocatalyst, and then uh, you have the contamination of the product. So that was a, a very technical uh, problem, but that made the process uh, not feasible at industrial scale. Um, if you look at the literature, actually different people try to overcome both problems. The problem of viscosity of the system as low kinetics that uh, make it difficult to mix and promote a mass transfer and the problem of enzyme robustness, the biocatalyst robustness. And uh, uh, actually the results are very frustrating. If you look for instance at this paper from Hamburg Polytechnic, they, they try to use different mixing system at the end, they, they got the grinding of the biocatalyst, basically. So the biocatalyst cannot be recovered. Okay, so taking in mind that we have to deal with recyclability, mechanical integrity, uh, prevent leaching, and improve reaction rate, first of all, of course, we try to avoid the problem of enzyme leaching. That was relatively simple by developing a covalently immobilized enzyme, just exploiting the amino group on the surface of the enzyme that were attached on a resin with some epoxy groups. Here you can see the difference between the commercial absorbed enzyme and the covalently immobilized enzyme. We uh, assayed the activity released into the reaction mixture. And uh, as you see here, you have a lot of free enzyme released from the immobilized biocatalyst after filtration. So that means that the, the actually the reaction goes, but it's catalyzed not by the immobilized enzyme, but by the free enzyme molecule in the system. Uh, whereas the uh, Im covalently immobilized enzyme does not release free enzymes, so that you cannot uh, find a free 
active enzyme in the reaction mixture. And also the covalently mobilized enzyme is uh, uh, recyclable much uh, more efficiently than the absorbed enzyme. Okay, what's uh, the, uh, the bad uh, part of the story? Uh, the best part of the story is, uh, of course, uh, that you have a lower surface and uh, a less efficient mass transfer. Uh, for instance, with the same reaction of uh, uh, polycondensation between uh, butandiol and dimethyl etaconate, if you use the absorb enzyme, you can reach 18 units uh, during the reaction. But if you use, oh, sorry. Oh. Oh, there is no picture, yes, yeah, sorry. But uh, uh, you saw before that if you use the immobilized enzyme, you can achieve roughly three or four units. That means that uh, most of the activity in this reaction comes from the free enzyme, the molecule, nicely dispersed in the reaction mixture. Of course, this is a problem. How we can overcome this problem? We cannot use the free enzyme to improve mass transfer and increase the surface. Uh, of course, you can increase the amount of the biocatalyst. And instead of working with 10% of biocatalysts uh, on a monomer basis, you can go to 20%, but it's too expensive. It doesn't, it's not uh, worthwhile. Uh, what we found out uh, uh, is that actually one solution is to use less enzyme, but it disperses on a higher surface of immobilization carriers. So we prepare a new, uh, a new immobilization preparation, um, less active, only 350, whereas uh, the commercial enzyme has an activity of 2,400. So this is uh, the results we got uh, using 30% of biocatalyst per gram. Uh, that means uh, 105 units per gram of monomers. So, so we, we reach uh, something like six uh, units, uh, whereas before the maximum was no more than three units. Um, what was the next step? Was the, to realize uh, that uh, the dial has a negative effect on the activity of the enzyme. And uh, since uh, the uh, rate determining step uh, is the formation of the acyl enzyme, the process goes much more effectively when the dial is at a stepwise um, and that also improve the elongation. So, uh, and then, of course, uh, we have to, uh, to discuss about uh, the process, how we can manage the uh, scalability of this process, how the enzyme can be used, the mixture can be mixed, the enzyme can be recovered, Possibly also improving the kinetic. What we uh, decided uh, was to <laughs> avoid any mechanical mixing system to preserve the integrity of the biocatalyst. In the lab, we work with a simple rotary evaporator. We work on the thi thin film. That means that you have vacuum, you have uh, a system where the uh, components are sufficiently dispersed. Of course, uh, the, then the question is how you can scale up a rotary evaporator in an industry. Uh, fortunately, there are very efficient uh, reactors called uh, um, uh, thin film reactor, turbo reactors, that uh, work on very thin films and uh, uh, 
They uh, proved to be very efficient, uh, for instance, in the polycondensation of uh, adipic acid and uh, butandiol. Um, the nice thing is that what is achieved in 20 hours, so uh, a molecular weight of about 1,500 with this reaction, with the turbo reactor can be achieved in 60 minutes. So uh, at this stage, basically, we perform the scaling up for the reaction between uh, butandiol and adipic acid. We are waiting for some project financing the pilot scale system for testing the scalability of uh, polycondensation of itaconic acid. And in conclusion, uh, what we can say is that, first of all, enzymes are worthwhile to be considered as an alternative when they are the only solution for solving specific chemical problems. Uh, in order to achieve the optimization of the process, uh, the, there is a need of uh, integrated multidisciplinary work, uh, engineer, uh, biotechnology, chemistry. For instance, in our case, we need a lot of uh, help from polymer chemists. And uh, I would also say that uh, uh, in the perspective, it's uh, uh, in my opinion, it's wiser to look for completely new solutions um, that are conceived in a comprehensive approach that put together enzymes, uh, the reactor, and new um, constraints of a biotechnological process, rather than adapting old solutions to these new processes. Uh, yeah, concerning itaconic acids, uh, we definitely are looking for some collaboration for the identification of high added value chemical targets uh, involving itaconic acid derivatives. Uh, and after that, we would like to uh, evaluate the feasibility of the uh, thin film reactor on larger scale also for this uh, polycondensation reaction. So at the end, I would like to thank people from the University of Trieste, from Spring Technologies, um, who immobilized the enzyme, Novozyme, who provided some free enzymes, and uh, the project and company who uh, financed this proje project. And uh, I thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you.